There's been a dramatic escalation in tensions between Russia's military and the Wagner mercenary group, raising fears it could lead to a civil war in Russia. Wagner's founder, Yevgeny Prigozhin, is calling for an armed rebellion and says his troops have crossed the border back into Russia from Ukraine. These pictures captured by Russians on the ground appear to show Wagner tanks and troops on the street in the southern Russian city of Rostov-on-Don. The Wagner founder earlier claimed in an audio post on Telegram that his soldiers had entered the city. Right now we have crossed the state borders in all directions. The border patrol came out to greet us and to hug our fighters. We're entering Rostov now. The units of the Defence Ministry, better say, the conscripts who were thrown here to block our way, stepped aside. We are not fighting the kids. We are not killing children. Chago kills children, throwing unprepared soldiers into war. He set 18-year-old kids against us. And in these pictures in just a short time ago, the Wagner founder is seen on the ground in Rostov-on-Don speaking with other soldiers for the confirmation that the mercenary leader and his forces have crossed the border back into Russia. The Wagner Group describes itself as a private military company and has been fighting alongside the Russian army in Ukraine for more than a year. But tensions between these private mercenaries and the Russian military have been simmering, with the boss of the Wagner Group accusing Russia's defence minister of incompetence. Now that tension has risen considerably. The Kremlin has accused the Wagner boss of calling for an armed mutiny. It comes after Yevgeny Prigozhin claimed the Russian military launched a missile strike against his men. Citizens in the region are being urged to stay indoors. Meanwhile, Russian security services have opened a criminal investigation into Mr Prigozhin calling for his arrest. In Moscow, riot police and the National Guard have been scrambling to tighten security at key facilities and government agencies, indicating just how seriously the Kremlin is taking the threat. Russia's military has urged Wagner's troops to obey the will of the President Vladimir Putin and return to their bases. Whatever your intentions are at the moment, as valiant as somebody told you they may be, this is a stab in the back both for the country and the president. Only he has the right to appoint the highest military commander, but you are trying to seize his power. This is a military coup. Dr Malcolm Davis from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute says that stakes are high, with the potential for the situation to deteriorate into a civil war. He's um, challenging the Russian military leadership, the Ministry of Defence, uh, for their gross mishandling of this war. And so he's now decided to launch an insurrection. Uh, and whether this turns into a coup or some sort of Russian civil war is early days yet, but it potentially could do so. And that's why everyone is focused on this, because if this does grow in scale and momentum, uh, and if it gathers support from within elements of the Russian military, rank and file, uh, then you you could very well see uh, this turn into a proper Russian civil war. And, of course, I would remind your viewers that Russia is a nuclear weapons state. Uh, so, therefore, the concern on the part of Western governments is ensuring positive control of those nuclear weapons to make sure they're not used in any internal conflict. And joining us now in studio is our global affairs editor, John Lyons. So, John, we're just seeing those pictures coming in of those troops we understand to be the Wagner mercenary troops on the ground in Rostov-on-Don, also the video of uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin and the claims that he's making. He's wanting to uh, uh, have those Russian leaders, in fact, uh, come to Rostov-on-Don. What do you make of the way that this uh, situation is unfolding and escalating? Yes, Miriam, it's clearly getting worse. Uh, what we're seeing now in the pictures is we're seeing that, as you say, the Wagner Group, Yevgeny Prigozhin, they've moved into Rostov-on-Don inside Russia, so they've left Ukraine, moved into Russia, and the significance of that city is that's been the launching pad, that's been the headquarters for the Russian army, its war in Ukraine. So while there's 150,000 or so Russian soldiers in Ukraine fighting, He's brought his 25,000 or so soldiers 
out and they've gone into the place and he says that all military sites uh, in Rostov-on-Don are now under his control. So if we can take him at face value, what it means is essentially he is saying, um, this is now my city, I control this, I control the military headquarters. It's setting up a possible battle uh, between Rostov-on-Don and the Wagner forces and other Russian soldiers and Moscow. What do you make at this stage of the response, or if you like, the lack of response that we've seen to date from Russia? Well, what they're doing in Moscow, a clear indication that this is serious, is the Kremlin overnight. It's about 8 a.m. there now. They've authorised, it's been army movements through the night. They are reinforcing all their major infrastructure facilities. Um, and they have, the Defence Ministry has said, what <coughs> Prigozhin is doing, they're blaming him, is leading to confusion that only benefits Ukraine. Um, it's hard to read. We believe Vladimir Putin has said it's been announced he's due to address the Russian people in the next hour or two, which will be absolutely fascinating to see what his approach is to this. This is the most serious crisis he's faced. And what's triggered it is uh, Prigozhin says that the Russian army fired a missile at his troops at the mercenaries. Um, he's always been a pretty wild card, always pretty unpredictable. He said that's enough. He's now unloaded and said the entire war was based on a lie, that NATO was never a threat to Russia, and that there was not this insane aggression from Ukraine. So he's undercutting the entire reason Russia's been at war. Now, it's possible that he's doing this uh, in cahoots with Putin because they want to get rid of Shoigu, the defence minister. But what's really interesting here is they have also now, though, the Kremlin has issued a warrant for his arrest, which suggests that he has gone rogue um, and that he's no longer operating with Putin. So if it becomes Putin versus Brigotchen, um, it could get very nasty because Brigotchen's troops, those 25,000 Wagner, are the toughest, nastiest, dirtiest fighters around. They will do anything. They're completely ruthless. And then on top of that, you have all of these um, private armies that the oligarchs have now been building up inside Russia since the war started last year. Those Russian billionaires have been hedging their bets in case it all turned bad. They wanted their own private armies of 40,000, 50,000 people. So you've only got to get one or two generals now who decides to activate the Gazprom army or the Wagner army, and then we see what we've been seeing in Sudan, the fight between two sort of ex-army chiefs. It's possible that that may happen in Russia. And we've also, um, my understanding is, we've also heard from uh, opposition spokespeople such as Mikhail Khodorkovsky mm. urging Russians to support uh, Prigozhin and, and the moves being made um, in Russia's south. Is there the potential for um, this situation to further uh, destabilise Russia? I think so. Unless Putin can resolve this, can dampen this down within hours, by the end of today, then if this starts to gain momentum, then it's looking very much like the beginning of a civil war. All right, John. Now, we also have our former uh, uh, foreign affairs uh, correspondent, Phil Williams, also joining us from uh, southern New South Wales. Phil Williams, of course, you, uh, you've been covering events in that part of the world for, for a very long time. What do you make of the developments at this stage? Well, it's extraordinary. Uh, it's uh, dramatic. It's happening very, very fast. And we simply don't know uh, what the outcome is going to be. But I agree with John, I think, unless uh, Putin can get on top of it very, very quickly, uh, then the signs are not good for him, uh, for his administration. Uh, it may be the case that the Russian army is able to contain the Wagner group uh, to that southern uh, part of uh, Russia near the border with Ukraine. Uh, but, you know, they haven't exactly covered themselves in glory in terms of being an effective army in the Ukraine itself. Uh, and they're up against those that were the effective fighters. So it's very difficult to predict the outcome of this. Uh, but it is a, a very significant turn of events after really weeks and weeks of provocation uh, from the head of the Wagner Group, really calling out the defence, uh, the head of the army and uh, the defence minister. Uh, and now uh, seemingly uh, having tipped, uh, tipped the scales and, and, and aggravated now the, the president 
and uh, he is now going to obviously try and suppress uh, this man who is perhaps even a pretender to his throne. John, is there potential for this type of pressure to um, uh, expose some cracks, if you like, in the military chain of command and even indeed more um, uh, with uh, Vladimir Putin, his presidency? Just how much is at stake there? Well, there is. And, you know, Phil's point that the Russian army may now have to concentrate on the Wagner people, which will mean the Russian army now is battling Russians who are fighting with Ukrainians, uh, Belgorod, some of them went in there recently. They're fighting Ukraine, which is now more be getting better armed by the day. And then perhaps now having to bring soldiers out of the Donbass to try to contend with these 25,000 mercenaries, as Phil said, who are very seasoned and they're good fighters. They're better than the average Russian army uh, soldier. The, the Battle of Bakhmut would not have gone Russia's way had it not been for the Wagner people. Um, these are seasoned, tough, well-paid mercenaries. So what it does now is it allows any general or any ex-KGB chief who's been sitting there for a year or a year and a half thinking it's madness what we're doing in Ukraine to say, now's my time to swoop. So I think Putin will be watching his inner circle and thinking, is anybody prepared to move? It is um, just incredible to think, um, Phil Williams, of um, just how this has escalated, the, the sorts of comments that Yevgeny Prigozhin has been making, the criticisms that he's been levelling at Russia, at um, those key military commanders, essentially putting a target on his, uh, on his own back, if you like. Uh, what, what are the options here? Because it feels as though there, there is no way back for Yevgeny Prigozhin at this point. No, absolutely. And you know, he's, there's all those troops that he commands that seem to have his loyalty, I guess, for as long as the checks flow. And that's another point. You know, the money obviously comes from the Kremlin in the first place. That'll be the first thing that's cut off if it hasn't been cut off already. So how do they then uh, keep their, tr their troops uh, inspired? I mean, in the end, you are effectively leading a revolution against uh, the, the Russian state as it is. Uh, it's it's an all or, all or nothing, do or die. Now, I'm sure at the moment, um, you know, that uh, Vladimir Putin would very much uh, hope it was die in terms of his competitor now. Um, but does he have the? Does he actually have the strength? Does he actually have the control of all of the army? Or um, if the Wagner Group make make inroads towards Moscow, does some of the regular army turn turtle and and say, well, we're with you and try and be on the winning side? That's why it's very hard to predict the outcome of this at the moment, but it's extremely high stakes. And yes, as you point out, there, there is no turning back now. One or the other of these men will win. Uh, John, is that a real prospect, um, given what we've been hearing about conditions for the Russian army, that there may be a, a number of uh, those soldiers who, you know, weigh up their options and consider to move yeah. in allegiance with uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin? Well, the only reason Prigozhin is alive now is because Putin allowed him to be. He's been the vocal critic of the Russian army, but it suited Putin. He was useful. If he's now lost his usefulness, he's left Ukraine, so he's not fighting there anymore. If he's lost his usefulness, then Putin will do what he does to a lot of his enemies. They'll either go to jail or worse. So um, Prigozhin now is, you know, we know Zelensky is a big target of Russia. Uh, Prigozhin now is the most endangered man in Russia because they'll either want to kill him quickly or they may surround Rostov-on-Don which is incredible when you think about it. That's their military headquarters for Ukraine. So Prigozhin's taken over the military headquarters. He can now say, I control the military headquarters. What are you going to do about it? It's almost like he's taunting Putin to say, come get me. You know, it's just the most fascinating standoff I've seen for a long time. Well, Phil Williams, given the significance of Rostov on Don then, um, what do you anticipate uh, will be the way that Ukraine now steps forward? Well, it's an incredible opportunity militarily to take advantage of this. Uh, they now have effectively the Russian army looking at, at its back, not forward. And uh, at the very time that Ukrainians are making their, their moves, although not, not, not potentially their full move uh, in terms of trying to get their territory back. So yes, it, they will be extremely pleased. They'll also be extremely cautious in case it's all an elaborate plot. I mean, there, that seems very unlikely at this point 
uh, but they will be sort of very look at, looking at, as if, in case, just in case they try to lure them in and then swoop back and destroy them. And that's very long odds uh, possibility. Uh, but yeah, at the moment, it looks like an, an absolutely golden opportunity. But you know, with these sorts of conflicts, with these sorts of wars, you, you have these sudden moments of opportunity that, that open up. Whether the Ukrainians are able to take full advantage of it remains to be seen. Uh, but right now, um, yeah, Putin's got bigger problems than Ukraine and they're on the home front. Well, as you point out there, Phil, and um, John bringing you into the conversation here as well on that point um, around the pressure on Vladimir Putin, as you mentioned, we're anticipating that he will be stepping up to speak to the Russian public shortly. Um, but what are his options? What's, what, what do you anticipate um, will be his moves and what he'll be taking into consideration at this point? Well, he has to, I think, strategically either sacrifice either his defence minister, Shoigu, or he has to sacrifice and try to imprison Prigozhin. He has to choose one or the other. He can say, Prigozhin, we know he's always been wild, he's been useful, but he's a wild man and everything he says about the war is wrong. It's, it was not a lie. NATO was a threat. Or he, he has to say the more radical approach is, Prigozhin's right... Um, I was misled by Shoigu and um, they lied to me. My senior command lied to me. But he, in a way to do that, it means that the last year and a half has been completely done on false pretences. So I think what he's likely to do is try to then target Prigozhin and perhaps order his arrest. But then you have 25,000 of Prigozhin's followers who will be angry. And Prigozhin does have support inside Russia, amongst the public. He's an ambitious guy. He's gone from being a hot dog salesman, owning a restaurant, to one of the most powerful guys in Russia. A lot of the public love him because he's been at the front line. He's a real straight-talking guy. He's interested in politics. This is his big play. If he lives through this, which he may not, he may not be alive in 24 hours, but if he is, then he might try to do a political alliance with Putin and come into Putin's administration. Well, Phil, I mean, uh, Vladimir Putin's state of mind is something that has been, you know, a matter of great um, uh, consideration and contemplation throughout um, the course of the, the Ukraine war in particular. Um, what do you imagine we might anticipate, given that um, there have been unexpected turn, turns of events and decisions being made uh, in a no number of um, situations leading up to this point? Well, like, I think what John was saying is very valid in the sense that you know, he may well capitulate in a sense of uh, get rid of those in the upper echelons uh, that uh, have uh, been uh, such offence to Prigozhin. But uh, the, other, the other point is that actually we don't really know. We don't know how this incredible uh, Wagnerian opera finishes. Uh, and it's quite possible that you would end up with some sort of stalemate, at least for a little while as well. Uh, and uh, with his troops, with the Wagner troops, kept uh, in the south there, away from Moscow, uh, while some possible deal is worked out, or uh, they they hightail it and put the pressure further on Putin by by progressing closer to Moscow. And if that happens, you know, at what at what stage uh, does it, does the the house of cards, in a sense, uh, collapse? And at what stage do the uh, do the troops loyal? to Putin, say, well, you know, we're, we're not in this anymore. This, this is actually a more attractive person to follow. Uh, you, he has exposed the lies that we've been fighting and dying for, and uh, we're not prepared to do that anymore. So whether or not, you know, that could mean laying down of arms or letting them get through or, or even joining them. So there are so many unknowns at the moment, but I can absolutely assure you Every defence and strategic analyst in every government around the world is watching this uh, absolutely uh, as closely as they possibly can because this could affect not just the security of the, the Ukraine-Russia um, war, but the, the whole of the world because the outcome could be, in the end, a new leader of Russia. That doesn't mean that it's going to be any better. That person is going to be better or that they end the war uh, with Ukraine, it could be somebody even worse or continuing the same sorts of policies. Um, but it does seem that whichever way you look at it, in the near future, there is absolute chaos ahead and we can't predict the ultimate outcome of that.
John Lyons, what would you like to add to that point there by Phil? Yeah, adding to Phil's point, the frightening thing about all of this chaos is um, it's a nuclear power. Putin has his nuclear cans on the nuclear code. He boasts about that. Recently, they've, he boasted about moving some of their tactical nuclear weapons, as if tactical makes any difference, to Belarus, to the north, right on the border with Ukraine. The frightening thing is that the man who's now in hiding, Putin, who's fighting for his life, uh, has his finger on a nuclear button. I mean, I, I hope that we never even hear about that again, but unfortunately, it's a reality.